for those who might not be familiar with it, can you outline who was selling what to whom and Absolutely. why? The, the situation was that when we came into office, because of the financial situation that I've outlined, um, the ANC had taken a position that we would reduce defence spending in favour of socio-economic spending, given the sorts of inequalities that needed to be made up. But by late 2008-2009, we were about to embark on the purchase of what will ultimately amount to $10 billion of weaponry mm. from jet fighters, jet trainers, helicopters, corvettes, which are sometimes known as frigates, mm. and submarines. Now, there was a very public process in Parliament known as the Defence Review, in which it was identified that the South African National Defence Force required about 8 billion rand of investment to modernise. Mm. To take that from 8 billion to what will amount to somewhere around 100 billion rand mm. shows how this thing got inflated. And the feeling, I mean, there were a number of motivations. One was there was a feeling that it would keep the white generals in the Defence Force happy, that they had all of these toys mm. that they could play with that showed that we were taking them very seriously and the Defence Force very seriously. There was undoubtedly a need for some modernisation, but on a mm. very small scale. But the way in which these things work is that senior arms industry executives, when we were negotiating, so from late 1991 mm. onwards until our first democratic election, would be on the periphery of the negotiations, whispering into the ears of people like Joe Modisa, who mm. they assumed would be the first post-apartheid defense minister, Tabo and Becky, mm. who they knew would be in effect a sort of a, a de facto uh, day prime day. minister almost. Yeah. Um, about how arms deals were actually incredibly valuable, not only for those things, mm. but also for a whole range of other things, including funding one's political party, mm. um, getting the economy onto a growth path through what are called economic offsets. So they started to dream about this far bigger deal. Mm. And unfortunately, what really lay at the core of the decision to go with this massive, massive deal mm. was first us, the South African government, being naive, mm. being taken in by these arms industry executives who go around the world, as I've discovered in my second book, yeah. promising that not only are they delivering weapons that are going to keep you safe, mm. but for every $100 you spend, they're going to invest 120 or $150 in your economy that is going to set you on a growth path that's going to create jobs, etc., etc. And the reality is that research of these offsets shows that in developing countries the benefits are never seen. They never deliver. They, what they do is they build in whatever penalties there are for non-delivery of these offsets into mm. the purchase price. So in some instances South Africa was paying a 35% premium for some of the goods that we were buying, some of the weapons. And that is so that they didn't have a problem if they didn't deliver on all these other things. But what lay at the bottom of this deal was the fact $300 million in bribes were paid. And that was the prime motivation. Mm. I believe that certain key people in the ANC leadership saw this massive arms deal, not only to do the weapon stuff, not only to do the economic mm. stuff, but also as a way of fighting our second democratic election in 99, because the mm. ANC really struggled for money after 1994. The yeah. Soviet Union was no more. The Scandinavians suddenly weren't so keen to give money to what was effectively a governing party. Yeah. And it wasn't only just for running an election campaign. There were many people who'd come home from exile, who'd never had jobs before, whose sustenance had come from the ANC for decades and decades, mm. and who were still dependent and reliant on the organisation. And I think this was the way they felt. Yeah. They could get the money to do all of those things. So it was quite clear that the Minister of Defence, Joe Modise, and uh, Shabby Sheikh, who was the Director yeah. of Procurement, um, yeah. took bribes. But how much higher did it go? What's, what's the, what was the well, ring of involvement, as I mean, it were? They were two of the key decision makers. Yeah. Um, Modisa's political advisor, a gentleman by the name of Fana Longwane, um, was certainly a key player in facilitating the bribes as mm. well. Um, I think it went, rather than up, I think it, it, it went um, horizontally almost. Mm. Um, I think there were a number of senior people on the boards of the main state arms companies in the Defence Force who did very well materially out of mm. the deal. Uh, many of them now living in Australia, interestingly, where Chippy mm. Sheikh upped and went when the pressure got a bit 
yeah. too much in South Africa. Um, and I'm often asked whether I feel that Tabo and Becky benefited personally, and I've never seen evidence that he did. Mm. Um, I believe that what Mbeki did is he condoned. He knew about it. He knew about it and he condoned the fact that some yeah. of the bribes were finding their way to the party, to the yes. ANC itself. Yeah. Um, I think and with that, it opened the door, presumably, to personal um, contributions as well as political contributions. Oh, look, I'm, I'm sure that, that some of that happened. And in the case of Jacob Zuma, the current president, mm. I personally believe that there is overwhelming evidence um, that through his financial advisor, Shabir Sheikh, who was Chippy Sheikh's brother, mm. keeping it all in the family. So you mm. had the head of procurement who was on the take. Then you had his brother, who was financial advisor to the then deputy president, mm. who was also on the take. And he facilitated a bribe for Zuma, of which he was found guilty in a South African court and sentenced to 15 years. Yeah. He was released very soon after Zuma became president. Um, mm very spurious circumstances. Um, so I do think that Zuma benefited personally, and I think that the ANC as a party benefited massively. Yeah. <clears throat> and that has been subsequently quite a sort of complicating factor, has it not, in, in sort of ANC politics, really? Well, to give you an indication, when I was trying to investigate this, um, I remember during a, a December holiday in Cape Town, just as the presidency was trying to persuade me to drop the investigation that the committee that I was the ranking ANC member on the Public Accounts Committee mm -hmm. in Parliament had had initiated, while that was happening, I was called to the house of a very senior ANC member of our National Executive Committee, our highest decision-making body, and he said to me, Andrew, you have to understand you're not going to win this thing. And I said, what do you mean? And he said, if you pursue this, it'll be the end of your political career because everybody in the party is going to close ranks around this issue. Mm. And I said, but why? Mm. Quite naively, I suppose. Mm. And he said, because this is how we funded the 99 election. And it's going to reflect incredibly badly on all of us, not just individuals who took the mm. money, but the fact that this is how... Um, we funded that election. We don't want that to become public knowledge, and mm. we broke the law. Mm. So he said, you know, even those who are sympathetic to you are not going to support you publicly, and in fact are going to do everything they can to stop your investigation. And that's exactly what happened. And Jacob Zuma was actually quite encouraging to you when you started yes. that investigation. What do you think his motivation was? <laughs> it was an extraordinary thing. I'd go from during the day... Um, being hauled into a meeting where the minister in the office of the president, um, the sort of Alistair Campbell figure mm. in Mbeki's presidency, a chap called Esop Pahad, would scream and shout at me and tell me, you know, that I had to mm. get rid of this investigation and this, that and the other in no uncertain terms. And then late at night, I would get um, a telephone call from Jacob Zuma's office and somebody would say, the chief wants to see you in his office and I'd make my way down to mm. parliament at half past 10, 11 o'clock at night or well, sometimes during debates I'd be called to a little room somewhere in Parliament where he'd be sitting, and he'd keep on saying to me, you know, having been sitting in these mm. meetings where I was being excoriated for trying to investigate it, he would say to me, it's your constitutional responsibility to investigate this matter. Just mm. keep at it. You're doing what you're supposed yeah. to be doing. And I was quite perplexed and confused by the whole thing. But then, after the fact, when I started working on what had actually happened in the mm. deal and talking to local prosecutors in South Africa who were prosecuting his financial advisor, it became a bit clearer to me. What happened was, um, Shabir Sheikh, his financial advisor, had done a deal on his behalf with a French arms company, which was then mm. known as Thompson CSF, in terms of which Jacob Zuma would receive half a million rand a year, not a huge sum of money, mm. but in order to further the interests of this company in South Africa, and that mm. included protecting them from any investigation into the arms deal. Mm. But there was no investigation into the arms deal at the point that they signed this agreement. So Thompson's never paid up. And Zuma himself experienced something of a cash flow problem around the time that we started mm. investigating the matter. He was building a, a new rural estate for himself and, and mm. his large family. And Shabir Sheikh didn't have the ready cash to, to give him for this. So they wanted to accelerate mm. um, the receipt of these bribes. And I honestly think 
that he thought that in me and in my committee there was an opportunity mm. that he could raise the pressure, mm. get Thompson's a little frightened, and then simply put a lid on the whole thing because mm. he assumed I was a loyal member mm. of the ANC and a very junior member. So if the deputy president of the country and the organization tells me mm. I've got to stop something, I'm going to stop it. Um, didn't quite work out like that, but I think that was his intention because what happened quite interestingly is we had lots of contact both with him and his parliamentary advisor mm. until the day in December 2000, I think it was, it was the 13th or 15th of December, where Shabir Sheikh received an encrypted fax from Thompson CSF saying to him, the first 500,000 rand will be in such and such an account on the 21st of January mm. 2001. And quite literally, from that moment on... Jacob Zuma, stop by <laughs> your phone calls. <laughs> yeah, that was the last time we have ever had any contact of any sort. Yeah, yeah. And what scale of bribes were involved? I mean, what, what's, what's the total sum and what from were people getting? From the sorts getting? of calculations we've been yeah. able to do, and obviously, you know, this is a world that is hidden behind a veil of national mm. security imposed secrecy, so it's very difficult to know exact figures, but we've done an enormous amount of work on this, and we estimate that the bribes were around 300 million. Now, that would be commissions that were mm. paid to middlemen, so the people who identified yeah. which politicians had to be paid off and how much, mm. they receive a lot of money for this. They would have received between 30 and 40% of the $300 million. Mm. Um, and they included a whole range of dodgy characters, some of whom act as agents for the biggest arms mm. companies like BAE Systems and others. Um, and then of the balance, so say 60% of 300 million, I estimate that just under half of that would have gone to the ANC itself in yeah. various forms, and the balance would have gone to individuals. Right. Um, so that would have been individuals, decision makers like Modisa, his political mm. advisor, Chippy Sheikh, etc., etc., um, Zuma, and also the others, so senior officers, senior directors of the boards mm. of the state arms companies, those who were involved in the decision making process. And Tabo and Becky did play a role, didn't he, in kind of making sure that the um, bid went through, irrespective of cost. He was sitting on a oh, key he, he, committee. Oh, he played an absolutely crucial role. I mean, he chaired the minister's committee because mm. the discussions around the deal started when Mandela was still president, but Mbeki chaired the minister's committee that made all the decisions. Mm. This was a committee that consisted of the finance, trade and industry and various other, obviously the Minister of Defence and various others. But the extraordinary thing was, on the BAE Systems deal, which was together with Saab, the Swedish company, mm. for a jet fighter and trainer, that the Air Force said publicly in South Africa they didn't want and they would only mm. accept if the politicians forced them to. The jet they wanted was two and a half times cheaper mm. than the BAE Saab offering. There was really nothing going for it whatsoever. It hadn't made the initial mm. shortlist. They completely manipulated the criteria so that it went up the shortlist and eventually won. And as you say, including the extraordinary step on the single most, in, the single most expensive contract the democratic South Africa mm. has ever signed, they excluded cost as a pro mm. procurement criteria, which is quite something. Um, so on that basis alone, the whole deal um, should have been rejected by Parliament and we shouldn't have refused to authorise the expenditure. Um, so he really, together with Modisa, they pushed through that BAE Systems won that contract, that two German companies won contracts for frigates and, and submarines mm. respectively, um, even after one of those contracts had effectively been awarded to a Spanish company. So he was very involved, together with Modisa, in manipulating mm. the process. But as I say, I think it was to ensure that the party was financed. got money. Yeah. yeah. And... Was there a link between corruption in the apartheid regime around things like Moldergate and corruption in the ANC? Is there is there a thread you can draw between those two? There things? are. There are links and uh, there are also differences. Um, the obvious difference is that apartheid as a system was systemically corrupt. It actually needed an almost parallel corrupt structure mm. um, that was financed off the books to maintain this illegitimate system through mm. various repressive means. And the scale of corruption was absolutely gargantuan.